Section 11 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Geller. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 11. The Dragon's Teeth. Part 1. Chapter 6. The Dragon's Teeth. Cadmus, Phoenix, and Cilix, the three sons of King Agenor, and their little sister Europa, who was a very beautiful child, were at play together near the seashore in their father's kingdom of Phoenicia. They had rambled to some distance from the palace where the parents dwelt, and were now in a verdant meadow, on one side of which lay the sea, all sparkling and dimpling in the sunshine, and murmuring gently against the beach. The three boys were very happy, gathering flowers and twining them into garlands, with which they adorned the little Europa. Seated on the grass, the child was almost hidden under an abundance of buds and blossoms, whence her rosy face peeped merrily out, and, as Cadmus said, was the prettiest of all the flowers. Just then there came a splendid butterfly fluttering along the meadow, and Cadmus, Phoenix, and Cilix set off in pursuit of it, crying out that it was a flower with wings. Europa, who was a little wearied with playing all day long, did not chase the butterfly with her brothers, but sat still where they had left her, and closed her eyes. For a while she listened to the pleasant murmur of the sea, which was like a voice saying, Hush! and bidding her to go to sleep. But the pretty child, if she slept at all, could not have slept more than a moment when she heard something trample on the grass, not far from her, and peeping out from the heap of flowers, beheld a snow-white bull. And whence could this bull have come? Europa and her brothers had been a long time playing in the meadow, and had seen no cattle nor other living thing, either there or on the neighboring hills. "'Brother Cadmus!' cried Europa, starting up out of the midst of the roses and lilies. "'Phoenix! Silix! Where are you all? Help! Help! Come and drive away this bull!' But her brothers were too far off to hear, especially as the fright took away Europa's voice and hindered her from calling very loudly. So there she stood, with her pretty mouth wide open, as pale as the white lilies that were twisted among the other flowers in her garlands. Nevertheless, it was the suddenness with which she had perceived the bull, rather than anything frightful in his appearance, that caused Europa so much alarm. On looking at him more attentively, she began to see that he was a beautiful animal, and even fancied a particularly amiable expression in his face. As for his breath, the breath of cattle, you know, is always sweet, it was as fragrant as if he had been grazing on no other food than rosebuds, or, at least, the most delicate of clover blossoms. Never before did a bull have such bright and tender eyes, and such smooth horns of ivory as this one. And the bull ran little races and capered sportively about the child, so that she quite forgot how big and strong he was, from the gentleness and playfulness of his actions, soon came to consider him as innocent a creature as a pet lamb. Thus, frightened as she at first was, you might by and by have seen Europa stroking the bull's forehead with her small white hand, and taking the garlands off her own head to hang them on his neck and ivory horns. Then she pulled up some blades of grass, and he ate them out of her hand, not as if he were hungry, but because he wanted to be friends with the child, and took pleasure in eating what she had touched. Well, my stars! Was there ever such a gentle, sweet, pretty and amiable creature as this bull, and ever such a nice playmate for a little girl? When the animal saw, for the bull had so much intelligence that it is really wonderful to think of, when he saw that Europa was no longer afraid of him, he grew overjoyed and could hardly contain himself for delight. He frisked about the meadow, now here, now there, making sprightly leaps, with as little effort as a bird expends in hopping from twig to twig. Indeed, his motion was as light as if he were flying through the air, and his hoofs seemed hardly to leave their print in the grassy soil over which he trod. With his spotless hue he resembled a snowdrift wafted along by the wind, 
Once he galloped so far away that Europa feared lest she might never see him again. So, setting up her childish voice, she called him back. "'Come back, pretty creature,' she cried. "'Here is a nice clover blossom.' And then it was delightful to witness the gratitude of this amiable bull, and how he was so full of joy and thankfulness that he capered higher than ever. He came running and bowed his head before Europa, as if he knew her to be a king's daughter, or else recognized the important truth that a little girl is everybody's queen. And not only did the bull bend his neck, he absolutely knelt down at her feet, and made such intelligent nods and other inviting gestures that Europa understood what he meant just as well as if he had put it in so many words. "'Come, dear child,' was what he wanted to say. "'Let me give you a ride on my back.' At the first thought of such a thing, Europa drew back. But then she considered in her wise little head that there could be no possible harm in taking just one gallop on the back of this docile and friendly animal, who would certainly set her down the very instant she desired it, and how it would surprise her brothers to see her riding across the green meadow, and what merry times they might have, either taking turns for a gallop, or clambering on the gentle creature, all four children together, and careening round the field with shouts of laughter that would be heard as far off as King Agenor's palace. "'I think I will do it,' said the child to herself. "'And indeed, why not?' She cast a glance around, and caught a glimpse of Cadmus, Phoenix, and Silix, who were still in pursuit of the butterfly, almost at the other end of the meadow. It would be the quickest way of rejoining them, to get upon the white bull's back. She came a step nearer to him, therefore, and, sociable creature that he was, he showed so much joy at this mark of her confidence that the child could not find it in her heart to hesitate any longer. Making one bound, for this little princess was as active as a squirrel, there sat Europa on the beautiful bull, holding an ivory horn in each hand lest she should fall off. "'Softly, pretty bull, softly,' she said rather frightened at what she had done. Do not gallop too fast. Having got the child on his back, the animal gave a leap into the air and came down so like a feather that Europa did not know when his hoofs touched the ground. He then began to race to that part of the flowery plain where her three brothers were and where they had just caught their splendid butterfly. Europa screamed with delight and Phoenix, Silix, and Cadmus stood gaping at the spectacle of their sister mounted on a white bull, not knowing whether to be frightened or to wish the same good luck for themselves. The gentle and innocent creature, for who could possibly doubt that he was so, pranced round among the children as sportively as a kitten. Europa all the while looked down upon her brothers, nodding and laughing, but yet with a sort of stateliness in her rosy little face. As the bull wheeled about to take another gallop across the meadow, the child waved her hand and said, "Goodbye," playfully pretending that she was now bound on a distant journey, and might not see her brothers again, for nobody could tell how long. "Goodbye," shouted Cadmus, Phoenix, and Silix, all in one breath. But together with her enjoyment of the sport, there was still a little remnant of fear in the child's heart, so that her last look at the three boys was a troubled one, and made them feel as if their dear sister were really leaving them forever. And what do you think the snowy bull did next? Why, he set off, as swift as the wind, straight down to the seashore, scampered across the sand, took an airy leap, and plunged right in among the foaming billows. The white spray rose in a shower over him and little Europa, and fell spattering down upon the water. Then what a scream of terror did the poor child send forth! The three brothers screamed manfully likewise and ran to the shore as fast as their legs would carry them, with Cadmus at their head. But it was too late. When they reached the margin of the sand, the treacherous animal was already far away in the wide blue sea, with only his snowy head and tail emerging, and poor little Europa between them, stretching out one hand toward her dear brothers, while she grasped the bull's ivory horn with the other. And there stood Cadmus, Phoenix, and Silix, gazing at this sad spectacle through their tears, 
until they could no longer distinguish the bull's snowy head from the white-capped billows that seemed to boil up out of the sea's depths around him. Nothing more was ever seen of the white bull, nothing more of the beautiful child. This was a mournful story, as you may well think, for the three boys to carry home to their parents. King Agenor, their father, was the ruler of the whole country, but he loved his little daughter Europa better than his kingdom, or than all his other children, or than anything else in the world. Therefore, when Cadmus and his two brothers came crying home, and told him how that a white bull had carried off their sister, and swam with her over the sea, the king was quite beside himself with grief and rage. Although it was now twilight and fast growing dark, he bade them set out instantly in search of her. "'Never shall you see my face again,' he cried, "'unless you bring me back my little Europa, to gladden me with her smiles and her pretty ways. Be gone, and enter my presence no more, till you come leading her by the hand.' As King Agenor said this, his eyes flashed fire, for he was a very passionate king, and he looked so terribly angry that the poor boys did not even venture to ask for their suppers, but slunk away out of the palace, and only paused on the steps a moment to consult whither they should go first. While they were standing there all in dismay, their mother, Queen Telephassa, who happened not to be by when they told the story to the king, came hurrying after them, and said that she, too, would go in quest of her daughter. "'Oh, no, mother!' cried the boys. "'The night is dark, and there is no knowing what troubles and perils we may meet with.' "'Alas, my dear children,' answered poor Queen Telephassa, weeping bitterly, "'that is only another reason why I should go with you. If I should lose you too, as well as my little Europa, what would become of me?' Let me go likewise, said their playfellow Thassus, who came running to join them. Thassus was the son of a seafaring person in the neighborhood. He had been brought up with the young princess, and was their intimate friend, and loved Europa very much, so they consented that he should accompany them. The whole party, therefore, set forth together. Cadmus, Phoenix, Silix, and Thassus clustered around Queen Telephassa, grasping her skirts, and begging her to lean upon their shoulders whenever she felt weary. In this manner they went down the palace steps, and began a journey which turned out to be a great deal longer than they dreamed of. The last that they saw of King Agenor, he came to the door, with a servant holding a torch beside him, and called after them into the gathering darkness. Remember! Never ascend these steps again without the child. Never, sobbed Queen Telephassa, and the three brothers in Thassus answered, Never, 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 never. And they kept their word. Year after year King Agenor sat in the solitude of his beautiful palace, listening in vain for their returning footsteps, hoping to hear the familiar voice of the queen and the cheerful talk of his sons and their playfellow Thassus entering the door together, and the sweet childish accents of little Europa in the midst of them. But so long a time went by that at last, if they had really come, the king would not have known that this was the voice of Telephassa, and these the younger voices that used to make such joyful echoes when the children were playing about the palace. We must now leave King Agenor to sit on his throne, and must go along with Queen Telephassa and her four youthful companions. They went on and on, and traveled a long way, and passed over mountains and rivers, and sailed over seas. Here and there and everywhere they made continual inquiry if any person could tell them what had become of Europa. The rustic people of whom they asked this question paused a little while from their labors in the field, and looked very much surprised. They thought it strange to behold a woman in the garb of a queen, for Telephassa, in her haste, had forgotten to take off her crown and her royal robes, roaming about the country, with four lads around her, on such an errand as this seemed to be. But nobody could give them any tidings of Europa. Nobody had seen a little girl dressed like a princess, and mounted on a snow-white bull, which galloped as swiftly as the wind. 
I cannot tell you how long Queen Telephassa and Cadmus, Phoenix, and Cilix, her three sons, and Thassus, their playfellow, went wandering along the highways and bypaths, or through the pathless wilderness of the earth in this manner. But certain it is that before they reached any place of rest, their splendid garments were quite worn out. They all looked very much travel-stained, and would have had the dust of many countries on their shoes if the streams through which they had waded had not washed it all away. When they had been gone a year, Telephassa threw away her crown, because it chafed her forehead. It has given me many a headache, said the poor queen, and it cannot cure my heartache. As fast as their princely robes got torn and tattered, they exchanged them for such mean attire as ordinary people wore. By and by they came to have a wild and homeless aspect, so that you would much sooner have taken them for a gypsy family than a queen and three princes and a young nobleman, who had once a palace for their home and a train of servants to do their bidding. The four boys grew up to be tall young men with sunburnt faces. Each of them girded on a sword to defend themselves against the perils of the way. When the husbandmen, at whose farmhouses they sought hospitality, needed their assistance in the harvest field, they gave it willingly, and Queen Telephassa, who had done no work in her palace save to braid silk threads with golden ones, came behind them to bind the sheaves. If payment was offered, they shook their heads, and only asked for tidings of Europa. "'There are bulls enough in my pasture,' the old farmers would reply. "'But I never heard of one like this you tell me of. "'A snow-white bull with a little princess on his back? "'Ha! Huh. I ask your pardon, good folks, "'but there never was such a sight seen hereabouts.' "'At last, when his upper lip began to have the down on it, "'Phoenix grew weary of rambling hither and thither to no purpose. "'So one day,' When they happened to be passing through a pleasant and solitary tract of country, he sat himself down on a heap of moss. "'I can go no farther,' said Phoenix. "'It is a mere foolish waste of life to spend it, as we do, in always wandering up and down, and never coming to any home at nightfall. Our sister is lost, and never will be found. She probably perished in the sea.' or to whatever shore the white bull may have carried her. It is now so many years ago that there would be neither love nor acquaintance between us should we meet again. My father has forbidden us to return to his palace, so I shall build me a hut of branches and dwell here. Well, son Phoenix, said Telephassa sorrowfully, you have grown to be a man and must do as you judge best but for my part I will still go in quest of my poor child. And we three will go along with you, cried Cadmus and Cilix and their faithful friend Thassus. But before setting out, they all helped Phoenix to build a habitation. When completed, it was a sweet rural bower, roofed overhead with an arch of living boughs. Inside there were two pleasant rooms, one of which held a soft heap of moss for a bed, while the other was furnished with a rustic seat or two, curiously fashioned out of the crooked roots of trees. So comfortable and homelike did it seem that Telephassa and her three companions could not help sighing to think that they must still roam about the world, instead of spending the remainder of their lives in some such cheerful abode as they had here built for Phoenix. But when they bade him farewell, Phoenix shed tears and probably regretted that he was no longer to keep them company. However, he had fixed upon an admirable place to dwell in, and by and by there came other people who chanced to have no homes, and seeing how pleasant a spot it was, they built themselves huts in the neighborhood of Phoenix's habitation. Thus, before many years went by, a city had grown up there, in the center of which was seen a stately palace of marble, wherein dwelt Phoenix, clothed in a purple robe and wearing a golden crown upon his head. For the inhabitants of the new city, finding that he had royal blood in his veins, had chosen him to be their king. The very first decree of state which King Phoenix issued was that if a maiden happened to arrive in the kingdom mounted on a snow-white bull and calling herself Europa, his subjects 
should treat her with the greatest kindness and respect, and immediately bring her to the palace. You may see by this that Phoenix's conscience never quite ceased to trouble him, for giving up the quest of his dear sister, and sitting himself down to be comfortable while his mother and her companions went onward. But often and often, at the close of a weary day's journey, did Telephassa and Cadmus, Silex and Thassus, remember the pleasant spot in which they had left Phoenix. It was a sorrowful prospect for these wanderers, that on the morrow they must again set forth, and that, after many nightfalls, they would perhaps be no nearer the close of their toilsome pilgrimage than now. These thoughts made them all melancholy at times, but appeared to torment Silex more than the rest of the party. At length one morning, when they were taking their staffs in hand to set out, he thus addressed them. "'My dear mother, and you, good brother Cadmus, and my friend Thassus, methinks we are like people in a dream. There is no substance in the life which we are leading. It is such a dreary length of time since the white bull carried off my sister Europa that I have quite forgotten how she looked.' and the tones of her voice, and indeed almost doubt whether such a little girl ever lived in the world. And whether she once lived or no, I am convinced that she no longer survives, and that therefore it is the merest folly to waste our own lives and happiness in seeking her. Were we to find her, she would now be a woman grown, and would look upon us all as strangers. So to tell you the truth, I have resolved to take up my abode here, and I entreat you, mother, brother, and friend, to follow my example. Not I, for one, said Telephassa, although the poor queen, firmly as she spoke, was so travel-worn that she could hardly put her foot to the ground. Not I, for one. In the depths of my heart, little Europa is still the rosy child who ran to gather flowers so many years ago. She has not grown to womanhood, nor forgotten me. At noon, at night, journeying onward, sitting down to rest, her childish voice is always in my ears, calling, Mother, mother, stop here who may, there is no repose for me. Nor for me, said Cadmus, while my dear mother pleases to go onward. And the faithful Thassus, too, was resolved to bear them company. They remained with Silix a few days, however, and helped him to build a rustic bower, resembling the one which they had formerly built for Phoenix. When they were bidding him farewell, Silix burst into tears, and told his mother that it seemed just as melancholy a dream to stay there in solitude as to go onward. If she really believed that they would ever find Europa, he was willing to continue the search with them even now. But Telephassa bade him remain there and be happy if his own heart would let him. So the pilgrims took their leave of him and departed and were hardly out of sight before some other wandering people came along that way and saw Silix's habitation and were greatly delighted with the appearance of the place. There being abundance of unoccupied ground in the neighborhood, these strangers built huts for themselves, and were soon joined by a multitude of new settlers who quickly formed a city. In the middle of it was seen a magnificent palace of colored marble, on the balcony of which, every noontide, appeared Silix in a long purple robe and with a jeweled crown upon his head. For the inhabitants, when they found out that he was a king's son, had considered him the fittest of all men to be a king himself. One of the first acts of King Silix's government was to send out an expedition, consisting of a grave ambassador and an escort of bold and hardy young men, with orders to visit the principal kingdoms of the earth, and inquire whether a young maiden had passed through those regions, galloping swiftly on a white bull. It is, therefore, plain to my mind that Silix secretly blamed himself for giving up the search for Europa, as long as he was able to put one foot before the other. As for Telephassa and Cadmus and the good Thassus, it grieves me to think of them still keeping up that weary pilgrimage. The two young men did their best for the poor queen, helping her over the rough places, often carrying her across rivulets in their faithful arms, and seeking to shelter her at nightfall, even when they themselves lay on the ground. Sad! 
sad it was to hear them asking of everyday passer-by if he had seen Europa so long after the white bull had carried her away. But though the gray years thrust themselves between and made the child's figure dim in their remembrance, neither of these true-hearted three ever dreamed of giving up the search. One morning, however, poor Thassus found that he had sprained his ankle and could not possibly go a step farther. After a few days, to be sure, said he mournfully, I might make shift to hobble along with a stick, but that would only delay you and perhaps hinder you from finding dear little Europa after all your pains and trouble. Do you go forward, therefore, my beloved companions, and leave me to follow as I may? Thou hast been a true friend, dear Thassus, said Queen Telephassa, kissing his forehead. Being neither my son nor the brother of our lost Europa, thou hast shown thyself truer to me and her than Phoenix and Cilix did, whom we have left behind us. Without thy loving help and that of my son Cadmus, my limbs could not have borne me half so far as this. Now take thy rest and be at peace, for, and it is the first time I have owned it to myself, I begin to question whether we shall ever find my beloved daughter in this world. Saying this, the poor queen shed tears, because it was a grievous trial to the mother's heart to confess that her hopes were growing faint. From that day forward, Cadmus noticed that she never traveled with the same alacrity of spirit that had heretofore supported her. Her weight was heavier upon his arm. Before setting out, Cadmus helped Thassus build a bower, while Telephassa, being too infirm to give any great assistance, advised them how to fit it up and furnish it, so that it might be as comfortable as a hut of branches could. Thassus, however, did not spend all his days in this green bower, for it happened to him, as to Phoenix and Cilix, that other homeless people visited the spot and liked it, and built themselves habitations in the neighborhood. So here, in the course of a few years, was another thriving city, with a red freestone palace in the center of it, where Thassus sat upon a throne, doing justice to the people, with a purple robe over his shoulders and a scepter in his hand, and a crown upon his head. The inhabitants had made him king, not for the sake of any royal blood, for none was in his veins, but because Thassus was an upright, true-hearted, and courageous man, and therefore fit to rule. But when the affairs of his kingdom were all settled, King Thassus laid aside his purple robe and crown and scepter, and bade his worthiest subject distribute justice to the people in his stead. Then, grasping the pilgrim's staff that had supported him so long, he set forth again, hoping still to discover some hoof-mark of the snow-white bull, some trace of the vanished child. He returned, after a lengthened absence, and sat down wearily upon his throne. To his latest hour, nevertheless, King Thassus showed his true-hearted remembrance of Europa by ordering that a fire should always be kept burning in his palace, and a bath steaming hot, and food ready to be served up, and a bed with snow-white sheets, in case the maiden should arrive and require immediate refreshment. And though Europa never came, the good Thassus had the blessings of many a poor traveller, who profited by the food and lodging which were meant for the little playmate of the king's boyhood. End of section 11. Recording by Tom Geller, Oberlin, Ohio, tomgeller.com.